The following episode is brought to you by Poison City Brewing, proud makers of Durban Poison Cannabis Lager, the beer that invites you to live your poison. Mark. How's it? All good, bro. How are you? Good, man. Hey, that is dope, man. Um, is this a good time? Everything good? We we 100% on? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I just pulled into Joburg about, went into my house about four minutes ago from Durban two hours ago. So, yeah, we're ready. <laughs> that is hectic, dude. What, what was happening down here in Durban? Uh, no, we just had some work done there. So... I got the secretary to organize a fast, uh, an earlier out flight so that I could be sitting here. The last interview I did was in the Durban airport. So, <laughs> and it's a bit <laughs> do, do you do you find that you you like do you travel a lot? You know, in in, in the in the line of work that you do. No, it's just now we've got um, uh, we've got SA Home Loans as a client, so I'm flying there once a week for the last four weeks. It's been like. That. That is so hectic, bro. Is that like, is that part of the day job? Because, like, yeah, my, yeah, my, yeah, yeah. yeah that is, that That's is. Day job. So now, <laughs> you know, I think at at this point, bro, like, what would interest, well, what is very intriguing, rather, is the fact that you're able to to balance both, you know, your day job and the band, and on top of that, other things as well that you do, dude. How do you even survive, bro? Like mentally. <laughs> I think balance balance is an overstatement. Don't ask my wife. <laughs> she, she, she'll tell you that the balance is completely one sided. <laughs> hey dude, listen, um so we we just gonna for anyone who's um just tuning in right now, uh just introductions. I am Nasi Pizwane, the host of Sledge Underground Podcast, and I'm gonna be hosting this episode alone today. We've got Mark, um, who is obviously the guitarist and vocalist of Fistmits. Now that name is very interesting, bro. I feel like you guys did a really good play on words there. What is what is the meaning behind the actual name of the band, bro? Uh, it it is exactly that. It's a play on words, but uh the band kind of evolved out of a bunch of previous bands um, where I just felt that like the, the three guys left standing in the room were the, the, the misfits that nobody actually wanted to be in a band with anymore. But because misfits is kind of already taken um, and we did this thing when we were at Varsity many years ago where we would constantly just swap uh, letters around in words. So we swapped the, the F and the M around and came up with Fismets. That's pretty much it, man. <laughs> when you when you say when you say that, you know, these are the, the the three guys that no one really wanted to be in a band with anymore, is that sort of on like a positive note or sort of like a negative thing? Like is it from past experiences maybe where you guys might have found that, hey, maybe you guys might have been the hardest working guys in the band and everyone else was slacking or maybe is it a situation of ah, people were like, ah, not too keen on working with these guys, you know, shed some light on that, bro. I don't know, you know, I mean, everything is very one-dimensional. You know, you're looking at it from your perspective. Um, there's probably another side to the coin, but I think it's probably the the former uh, of your statements because it's kind of like, you know, we would have band practice twice a week and and then guys would stop arriving and then we would invite other guys to band practice and they would arrive once and then not arrive again kind of thing, you know. So it's, I think it's more of a case of uh, we're kind of, uh, what's the word, sort of very focused in what we, at least the disciplines, the, uh, I can't remember the word, but it's kind of like the disciplines, the, the, the you know, the, the tribal the procedures that you follow as a band. You got to, you got to keep in that rhythm. Otherwise, it's, you know, it, it floats around. Uh, unfortunately, most of us have all got day jobs. We've all got lives. We've all got families. And if we don't schedule these things, other things jump in the way. So, I think maybe it was exactly that that we were probably more focused, and everybody else was allowing other things to. Not get in the way, but they were always having other stuff. And then, if you stop coming to band practice, it's easier to not come to the next band practice. Yeah, you know, it's, I think it's very interesting as well. You know, the fact that all of you guys have day jobs. You know, this sort of makes me think: like, is it is it possible in South Africa to sort of sustain yourself via just a music career, like straight up, without having a day job or anything like that? You know, what's your take on that? 
I think it is. I, I honestly do. I, there's a lot of guys that do it. I mean, and then I say that, and then I just see the email that I got yesterday about, uh, you know, Gary, Gary Herselman, you know, so it's like, there's a really good, one of the really great artists of sort of the eighties with kind of formula blues band. And then the carols after that. And I mean, he's, and now he's, he's fallen on hard times, you know, the, the day job does allow you to not live so much if you're clever. Well, if you, if not, if you're clever, but if you manage it correctly, you don't have to live from hand to mouth. You can still you know, contribute to kids' school fees and your own pension fund and all that sorts of stuff. So, but I think the, I don't want to say the good guys. I think the guys that do well, I mean, I'm sure people like Prime Circle are fine. I don't know. You know, maybe I need to ask them. I don't know. I think, and I think there's also an element of, I don't want to call it selling out. As a 20-year-old, as I would have said that a lot of these guys sell out and they do other music or they do, uh, what would you call it? You know, they would, you know, they would do maybe do ads or they would play covers uh, or they would, you know, they would do things that I would have in my 20s said that's, you know, that's sacrilege. If you're an original rock band, you can't be going and playing covers all night long somewhere else. But I've since changed my mind. I think I get that I decided to rather do a day job. And those folks have decided, well, they're going to keep working on their talents. They're going to be session musos. They're going to play on other people's tracks. They're going to write jingles. They're going to do everything from theater all the way through to trying to get a number one album in the world. Uh, and and I think those folks are seriously harder working than I am. You know? So I don't think it's impossible. I just think it's a... You need to be really professional. I think, uh, and I've worked with Barry Funsale. I've worked with a lot of big jazz musos, and these are actually serious to professional. They have a sales pipeline. They make sure that they've got gigs lined up for the next six to eight months. You know, it's not hand to mouth. He's got a pipeline. So sales is important too. <laughs> Interesting, because now if we had to relate this to the first myth, um, would would this ever be a route that you guys would ever consider taking? Considering how, as you made like a perfect example about Prime Circle and and a couple of the the jazz artists that you've worked with as well, you know they're doing this, and it's sort of like they're just doing strictly this, and it's working for them, you know. And 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 for you guys, is this something that you guys would ever look at and be like, you know, what, perhaps let's write that jingle, perhaps let's jump on, you know, write music for for other people and all that there. Uh, I think the opportunity would have to slap itself in the face, to be honest with you. I think you you make your call and you get on that bus and, you know, for me to suddenly put myself in the market and say, you know, I want to write a few jingles is going to mean a lot of time and energy to try and promote that side of the brand, if you want to think of it that way. And I haven't, uh, A, I'm a useless salesman, but B, I'm probably, um, you know, it's it's going to be a hard sell uh, especially where I am in life now. And that the, unfortunately, the realist in me just looks at the risk and says the, the, the risk far outweighs the, the opportunity. It would probably be, have to be a backward, uh, a backward um, sort of business plan. You know, like you see an actor, you know, these actors get famous and then all of a sudden they're releasing albums and then they're, they're doing other things because of who they are as a, as a personality certain doors open. I think if I have to knock on doors, uh, people are going to go, who's this Mark Biagio character? And he's banned the first you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, I, think, I think, would you not say that, you know, in, in your position, you know, also considering, um, you know, being uh, uh, part of, you know, Mix 93.8 FM and whatnot, do you not think that that would sort of put you in a position where if you did sort of, you know, jump ship, you know, a lot of doors would open. Would you say that, that that would sort of be, you know, a positive aspect and something that would help towards that maybe? Um, well, I'm not with Mix anymore. I'm now with uh, Rebel Rock Radio. But I did explore that when I was with Mix FM. Um, I spent a lot of time with the daytime jocks, for lack of a better word. And, uh, I, you know, I suddenly realized that where they are in their lives, I mean, these folks are radio personalities three hours a day or whatever their show is. And then they're literally going from gig to gig and uh, marketing something or other from hosting 
uh, you know, uh, quiz nights and then tearing off to here and then playing maybe a set in a club when we could still have clubs and things like that. Um, and you're away from home a lot. So, and then I looked at them and I realized all but one of them had a family. So it's, it's going to be sacrifices in places where you've already made commitments. And then I, that's when I realized, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to continue being a radio presenter uh, for, you know, for the enjoyment and for hanging around with people I enjoy. I, it's going to take a lot. It's going to take a serious big commitment to, uh, to make it a full-time job where I can equal my current salary. It's it's this part about about radio really it interests me a lot, man. I know we're talking about first minutes here, but you know, considering that we are talking to you, uh, just to, to to sort of focus on you a bit a bit more, you know, with your experience on on Rebel Rock as well, and just having been part of the music industry for over thirty four years, um, you know, what 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 has it sort of taught you, man, about you know the South African music industry, um, and tools that you've taken with you and sort of you know, kept in mind when it comes to first mids? I don't, I don't necessarily think there's anything I've necessarily taken up with, with. I think the only thing that keeps you going, if we put it more from that angle, is to, it's as an artist or as a, as a creative person, who whether you're painting or whether you're an actor probably or something like that, um, <clears throat> generally you have something to say, you know, you have something that's in you that needs to get out of you. And that's the drive that keeps you going. Uh, you know, so it's it's a case of, that's why I say it's the discipline of having the band practice. It's the discipline of always writing songs. It's about making time for that in your day. And and that keeps you inspired. That gets you through all the other KAK that happens to be out of there. You know, um, so you don't get yourself down. So I don't think there's necessary tools in that. I think it's just a case of like, don't give up because then you compromise on who you are personally, you know, as a person. But also if you read a lot, I'm a big fan of reading artists' biographies and autobiographies and things like that. And, you know, when you read Neil Young stuff, when you need Bruce Springsteen stuff, when you read uh, Bruce Dickinson from Iron Maiden, you know, these folks work seriously hard, you know. And I think you know, in the face of all adversity, they just keep trucking on. And uh, like I said, kind of in a previous interview, if you keep, you know, I might never make make it to that train station when that train eventually arrives and I manage to get Fismits on board and we can actually do this. But I'm sure as hell going to keep trying. But I'm not so stupid that I might risk my entire my entire family for me to make Fismits, you know, on the top, on the billboard 100. Yeah, unfortunately, that's the realist in me. So, yeah, indirect answer, right? <laughs> no, nah, man, it, it it makes a lot of sense. And I mean, considering your experience as well, man, like you know, thirty four years is, is is a very long time. Um, you you've been doing this like since way before I was born. So, you know, how, how would you say? Um, would you say there are any differences, you know, from when you started in in the in the music scene in general, just in South Africa, um, from when you started oh, to now? Yeah, it's 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 day and night. Um, certain things are way easier, and certain things are completely a stuff up. So uh, you know, if I go back to the early '90s when I was in Durban and I was playing in a band there called the Mind Theatre, you know, then the idea was that you would you put all your pennies together, you went into a big re- recording studio there behind the wheel in Durban, and you you recorded a demo and then you you literally went to the post office and you put that those cassettes in packaging and you sent them off to the record companies and hoped you got something back and you gigged you, you gigged like crazy which is probably the only constant is the gig um nowadays if i fast forward you know 30 odd years everybody is almost recording in their own house so everybody's got a crap demo out there which is so you, you everybody's putting their stuff out there but the quality isn't too good but they can then release it themselves so easily. You know, they don't need to be putting stuff in. They could just do it themselves. They can come up with crazy, you know, in the 90s, it would have been Wayne's World thinking, but now every YouTuber has got his own vibe. You know, so it's like, just do something completely radical on YouTube and you can actually build your brand way easier now. But then again, again, the problem is your competition 
is so steep. You know, I was, I, I was uh, when we did our first EP, I was trying to figure out, you know, what is, you know, iTunes and all this stuff. And I'm looking at the top 100 songs, rock songs or alternative rock songs. And I'm still, you know, what is it? You know, like 50, 60 years later, we're still competing with Bohemian Rhapsody. You know, we're still competing with the Beatles. They're all occupying the top 100 and rightly so. But if it was difficult for your consumer to get that music, then your consumers would be more current. They'd be buying the CDs. You know, they wouldn't, you know, now so your consumer gets to listen to, I mean, my kids love Queen, which is great, but that's all they listen to. They're not listening to the band down the road. And they're never going to listen to the band down the road as long as Queen is on their playlist because it's a hell of a step up for the Fizzmits to match Queen for, for that instance. So it's like, a, you know, the, comp- the, the playing fields are completely different you can put your stuff out there, but nobody's going to find it. So, yeah, you need marketers. You need you need some sort of a differentiator, probably more so now than you did previously. Whereas in the old days, you could probably create a very local localized vibe. I think you know from your vasty crowd or whatever, you could pull that. That's my so it's very different, but still a major challenge. It's very interesting what you were saying there about, you know, the whole process. You go and record a demo and, you know, you send it off via the post office and whatnot. And these days, um, everyone's making their own vibes and like within their own homes and all that. There. Would you say that the, the way that things are currently, um, you know, just from someone who's got, you know, a lot of experience in this and many years in this, um, would you say that the way things are right now, um, there's basically no need for record labels at this point yeah apart from a network so what your network what what i mean what your record company does for you now is he's really just an extension of your network you know he's a net- network that you can't get into so they can maybe open a, fo- a few doors locally or a few doors you know overseas so it all depends on the size of the network but that's pretty much it so i i, I definitely think a record company as it stands is, I mean, just if you drive around Joburg, I mean, uh, the record companies, I mean, I used my first job in a recording studio was in the old EMI building, which was right next to EMI pressing plant where they used to make the records and all that sort of stuff. And uh, it was huge. It was like three industrial blocks kind of thing. Uh, the Sony building in Johannesburg was huge. I mean, BMG occupied a huge number of floors in a uh, metal box house in, in, in near, there near Auckland Park. They don't exist anymore, you know. So it's, it's, I, I definitely agree with you. Long one, short answer is, yeah, I, I don't think anybody needs them, but you need those guys that can open doors for you, you know. But maybe your manager can do that. Maybe your PR guy can do that. I don't, you know, that's all you need. And, and, you know, just looking at at Fismet uh, at this point and a uh, point that you actually brought up um, when when you had your band going down here in Durban many years ago, uh, are there any sort of experiences that you may have taken from previous bands that you've been in that you've sort of carried with you into Fismet as well? Like, say, for example, um, maybe there was a certain experience or something that happened with, with previous bands and it was sort of like, okay, now I know not to do this. Now I know to do this in the next band and whatnot. Or is Fismet sort of like a, you know, balls to the wall, like do whatever the, the, the hell type thing? I don't think Fismet is the latter. Um, but again, I think in, in the previous bands, uh, if I use the Mind Theater as, as an example, I mean, it was a, it was a phenomenal four piece band, especially after Job, after Durban and moved up to Joburg. And, uh, our singer songwriter, cause then I was just a guitarist. Um, in, in, in my opinion is, is, is probably one of the, the most brilliant songwriters, uh, that I've ever worked with. It is a shame that he is also now just a family man, you know, living overseas and not doing too much. You know, it's it's a shame that we actually gave that up. And that's why I refuse to let Fismet's why I refuse to let my passion stop is because, you know, I look back and I go, damn, you know, we should have just, we should have just somehow figured out how to keep this thing going. You know, it's because there is, 
and again, it's the artist in me. It's there's, there's things there that people need to hear. You know, I'll zoom out and I'll, I, and I'll think of like Afrikaans alternative music from the 80s. You know, there's Afrikaans bands that South Africans that, that were running around in the 80s, the late 80s, that were telling the government of the day, that couldn't play, that were being shut down by the police, that were calling the Nationalist Party exactly what they were doing. They were, they were the voices of the people. They were the people telling us guys what was actually happening that the government of the day wasn't telling us, right? And it, it is so important that the young kids of today get access to, to those unsung heroes. You know, these guys that had the balls to risk everything at the age of 19 and 20, you know, and nobody knows about them to, to a degree, uh, you, you know, and, and, and that's why I feel as an artist, you know, even if I've got, I feel if, I, if it's in me, it must come out. And that's why we keep going, you know, that's pretty much it. I think I think what you just said there is really important. You know, just for context, uh, give us one of those bands that we should check out for anyone who's listening. For me, like myself as well, this is something I'm interested in as well. Just a name, and maybe where we could even find their stuff if their stuff is still available. Actually, is their stuff still available anyway? Yeah, no, that's the thing. That's all. You know, like I said, it, they've managed to all put it out there on the digital age. So anything on the Shifty Music label. You, you should check out. I mean, obviously, some of it's going to be a bit weird, um, but definitely the, the 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 cornerstones would be sort of Hara for me the blues band. Uh, you know, Johannes Kerkorl is and and um, uh, the guy I mentioned earlier, uh, shit, but now the, the name, oh, Pete Pers was his stage name. He was the bass player in that. Uh, Gary Herstelman, you know. And especially if you can get a hold of their live stuff, they've got a they've got a live recording that was done live at the University of Pretoria, and I mean it is phenomenal. I make sure I play it on my shows on on on, on rock radio, uh, and then the other one is a band called Quiz, not not um, uh, Quiz Com Bass. There was actually a band called Quiz, and you'll recognise the lead singer's voice because he's actually an actor on on a lot of TV programs. And they were really out there. But if you listen to it lyrically, they also do, you know, they mix English and Afrikaans. But it's like, you know, Julius would be proud <laughs> of what these guys were saying and what they were doing. And that's what it's like, you know, unfortunately, pigeonholing is a good thing sometimes and pigeonholing is also a bad thing. And this is where pigeonholing is a bad thing, you know, uh, you know, modern day. But it's, yeah, check out Quiz. Again, you know, misremember, it's angry music. So it's not punk angry. But it can get noisy. Kind of for me, the blues band was very much more blues orientated. But wow, you know, I mean, the, just the lyrical content is just phenomenal. And sometimes all those lyrics that were about the Nationalist Party, you can translate thirty years later. And if you remove the name, you would think they were singing about our government. You know, at times <laughs> it is. You know, history history repeats itself, and that's and that's also why I'm like, guys, we need to be listening to this. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Wow. This is this is this is a this is like a gold mine, bro. You're giving us all these gems. Yeah. So I think people certainly should check all of that out, bro. You know, just going back into to first minutes, we are gonna. Well, that was a very interesting point there about the whole political thing because I I, I did you know when when Diva sent through the the bio and stuff, I did see that you guys also, you know, you talk a lot about you know, those sort of aspects and whatnot, which is something I'd like for us to touch on a bit later as well. Um, but, you know, just for now, looking at your, your guys' genre, um, being alternative space rock, what is that space for? What is the meaning behind that? Yeah, I, th- I think I think that's a marketing thing. And, and, I, and I think it's cool. We, we, we kind of go with it. Um, but I think the, his- the history of it is that we're definitely alternative rock with a huge slice of indie. And when I mean indie, I feel there's that 90s indie that comes in, especially maybe in the guitar world. Um, but the space rock came from Luke, my drummer, who uh, in the very early days, he was like, he would, whenever we WhatsApped each other uh, and everything was fine on his side, he would send me a rocket ship, you know, instead of the thumbs up or whatever the case was. He would send a rocket ship, Yeah. So I said to him, what, what's the point of what, what's happening with the ro- this rocket ship? So he says, no, we're a space rock band, man. So on our website or on our Facebook page or one of those, I said, Luke claims we play space rock, whatever that is. So I think Devo has, has, has 
has pushed this as a differentiator, which is cool. <laughs> it, does, it, it certainly does work, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, I, I think we're out there, but if you go and look at space rock, it is a genre on its own, and we're kind of not there. <laughs> so it could be alternative space rock because that's alternative to space rock, you know. So there you go. Yeah, I feel you. I feel bad. Now, 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 listen. Tell us about your guys' debut album, uh, before the hindsight. Um, firstly, let's break down that name. Um, how did you guys come up with that particular name for it? Yeah, it, it's 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 a funny one. Oh, it's a tricky. It's a, it's a tricky one. It's kind of got a, a couple of meanings in it, and I like to let people figure figure they out, figure it out. But in in essence, if I can try and break it down without wandering around, um, it's 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 kind of like we set out with a plan to do X, Y, and Z in twenty eighteen. So twenty seventeen, we'd had done the EP anyway. That was our sort of stepping into the market. That's saying here is. The fismets. This is what they're all about. So we still had a, a, a huge catalog of songs to record, and we set out about a plan. Okay, that plan got derailed hugely uh, from 2018 all the way through to the end of 2019. Um, and then when I sat down at the beginning of this year, and I took well, sort of during the COVID phase, I sat down and started taking stock of everything we'd set out to do but hadn't actually done. And then I realized we actually have an album here. Um, so there is this this concept of, you know, hindsight is 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 is, is, is 2020. So now I thought, sure, but we've actually got an album. Let's let's push this out. But that actually wasn't the plan. So the hindsight was that I'd realized that uh, I, we had an album, but the, 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 there was a before the hindsight, actually, the hindsight moment, you know, uh, plan. But then I also realized that hindsight is 2020, so this is all the recordings done before 2020. So <laughs> there's, a, there's a literal and there is a, <laughs> a fuzzy vibe, a, a fuzzy meaning in before the hindsight. That was that was a perfect explanation, bro. Obviously, it's got you know twelve tracks on there. Um, you know, tell us, you know, were all these tracks sort of recorded, you know, in one session? You know, how long did it take you guys to actually record the entire album? No, oh, it took us. Uh, it didn't take us a long time. So, if between twenty, the middle of twenty seventeen and twenty nineteen, this is when we did the most of the tracks. There been a there was a there was a a. a my keyboardist had to step away, so we lost the keyboardist. Then there was a bass player change. Um, so there were, uh, so then we always had to pick up and start and stop and get Neil on board, teaching him the parts and everything like that. And in between, there were gigs. So what we were doing is uh, we were recording, doing a lot of recording in our rehearsal room. Now, me being a, a, being a, a, a sound engineer from back in the 90s, having recorded tons of Kwaito and tons of African jazz and stuff like that. I have, and my, because I have a day job, I have a lot of kids. So we were, a ba- we were, we were able to record quite well a lot of our, our recording sessions, but not for an album, you know, just so that we can hear the songs after they, you know, because while you're playing a song, you think it feels great. And then when you listen back to it, you realize, that, no, it doesn't sound that good. Or also what I like to do is I like to take the song as we play it live and then start playing with arrangements. And things like that to, to see, you know, uh, you know, is is the arrangement right? Is it missing something? You know, that sort of stuff. So we had all these recordings, and then as the band was, as the three piece was getting up to speed in 2019, we went to a, a Steve Dyer's studio, Dyer Tribe Music, and cut five tracks there. Um, yeah, so that's how, and then. But then what happened is it, it going into uh, the back end of 2019, Luke, my drummer, his wife decided she's going back to America and she's taking him with him. With, she, well, he has to go with her kind of thing. So, so I, I, you know, so I, we didn't do too much work on those recordings going into the last half of 2019. I think I was a bit broken, uh, you know, just a bit uh, sort of out of – sort of had the wind knocked out my sails a bit. But then, like I said, COVID gave me the actual time to go through all these recordings and I realized, you know, this song is a 
one guitar line away from being finished. This song is actually a vocal away from being finished. This song just needs, you know, a, a new lyric and it's fine. And then all of a sudden I had the album. This is, this is really beautiful, man, especially because, you, you know, you are taking us through the journey and some of the difficulties that you guys actually, you know, encountered during the process of, you know, or the making of the actual album itself. You know, ever since the album came out, bro, um, how's the push been? You know, how have people sort of received it? I haven't had negative uh, comments. Uh, it seems to be, you know, it seems to be doing way better. I mean, if, if I had to compare it to how the EP was received in 2017, it's, it's a 400% improvement. I think a lot of that has to do with network too. I think, you know, I've, I've got some guys who buy into the project. I think a, a lot of people, you know, buy in to, to uh, you know, to what, what I'm about and what I, what, what, well, what I'm about, what the band is about, what we say, I think, um, you know, there's a good progression on, you know, like I said, there's a good progression on the previous one. So we definitely stepped it up. Uh, I think once we, once we get out of, uh, more of a lockdown situation and we start doing a lot more shows going to the idea is the beginning of next year, I think that will be the, the acid test, you know, are we pulling more people, you know, are we actually pulling people to an event as opposed to uh, piggybacking of somebody else's pulling of people, you know, when you play like a five band festival or something like that. Uh, And well, you know, the thing is as an older band, you don't come with rent a crowd. I remember the mine theater, we would arrive at playing Vic Bar down Point Road, Durban, and we would pack the place out. Why? Because all our friends were from university and had nowhere else to go. And they would bring girlfriends with, and they would bring friends with, and so you you had a rent a crowd, you know. Uh, we don't have rent a crowds anymore, not at our age. <laughs> so, so, so it, we actually need to draw people on 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 sheer. Uh, value, you know, on on what we're offering, on the product has to be that good that people are wanting to give up Netflix and come and watch a band and risk getting COVID and that sort of stuff. So it's it's going to be an acid test uh, that that I look forward to, but it also scares the living hell out of me. That's this is a really interesting conversation. Like I'm really enjoying this. You know, for for you on the actual, you know, album itself. Um, we, we almost at the end of this segment, man. Um, which would you say is your favorite song? Like when I was looking at the track list, a couple of names jumped jumped out at me. Like for example, uh, Cactus. Uh, I think there was there was another one. Um, I think it was amazing, and preferably men was one of them, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Like these are these you're are some. <laughs> you're my best mate, but you must know when you ask an oak who writes songs and puts them together, it's like to, which is your favorite. It's like you asking me which one of my sons do I prefer. <laughs> <laughs> Which, oh, you can't really which, 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 that. you know, you can't do <laughs> You know, what I can tell you, what I can tell you is that if I had to run through the 10 songs, yeah. the 12 songs, yeah. I would tell you why I, why I'm really attached to each one of those songs in a different way. Tell me, tell me about the, what can I say? The son that is getting A's in school. He's, he's like, okay, as much as you love all your sons, He's just sort of just excelling. And it doesn't mean that you love your other sons less. I don't know if I can do that. I mean, I think, I think um, th- there's different songs for different reasons. So, um, yeah, I, it, it, it's difficult to choose. There, there's ones that I thought were going to be good that haven't really moved. And then there's other ones that have uh, tweaked people's interests. You know, so it's difficult. So now I'm looking at that and going, hmm, this, you know, doesn't make, doesn't necessarily make sense. doesn't mean I don't like that song. It just means that it caught me. I liked it for a different reason and I didn't think it would actually move, move things. You know, so, you know, I'm glad you picked up on, on certain things. Like Preferably Men is probably one of my favorite songs of all time. I wrote that years ago. And finally, uh, I love it because that recording is Luke the first time he heard it. I played it to him acoustically in the band room and, we jammed it, and pretty much that was the second take. So there was no—we've never played that song live, um, 
And it's, you know, it's a song about a book, I, a book my wife gave me, an Afrikaans book. You know, so it's like, I, that's what I love about that song. Amazing. I love that song because that song is about my nieces who live in America and they came to stay with me. And I wrote that song watching these two girls go crazy and wild, you know, like there is no tomorrow, uh, you know. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's like you can't choose. The two stories are too different. Uh, you know, Cactus surprised me because we used to cover that. We, that's a cover of the Pixies. And we, we played that song live. But when I went to the album, I was like, you know, I need, I, I want to put something that's a bit more familiar to people. You know, 12 original songs. Let me try and put something that's familiar, but not an obvious cover. So I just picked up the guitar and in an hour, that's one live take that went down. And I was like, actually, that's not bad. You know, I actually like it. I, I, I used to have a problem as a, as a non-singer singing in the physimus. You have Most singers have a problem with their voice, but I'm not a singer. I only started singing in the, since 2015, 20, 20, 20, yeah, 20, 2017. Um, you know, so it was like, when I listened to that, I go, well, actually, I did, I'm actually proud of that vocal take. You know, it's, I love it, you know. Uh, I wish the bloody pixies would hear it. <laughs> listen, uh, listen, Mark, bro. Uh, I think I think for now, because of this forty-minute Zoom limit, unfortunately, we're gonna have to close yeah. the show out here for this segment. If you're keen on us uh, pushing on for one more session, I would so love that. I've still got a lot that I need to ask you, dude. Like a lot that I could learn from you as well, and I think a lot that the audience could learn from you as well. So I think we should, uh, for now, bow out with uh, preferably men. Um, and then before we bow out, though, I'd like for you to just give us all your handles and the band's handles and whatnot, and we can just close out this segment like that. There. You see, now you're putting me on the spot with my. We, we, we could definitely do another segment. I'm all yours. That's fine. That's perfect. Um, uh, catching me on, on, on the handles. That's why my marketing sucks. That's why I have Diva. So uh, everything everything should be the Fizmits, except for Facebook. There you're going to do at Fizmits Band. And Fizmits.com is the website, and there's a simple one-pager website, and all the links are at the bottom to get you to the YouTube channel and all the rest of it so that's the easiest business.com you nailed it man you nailed it like you're natural so it's it's all it's all good <laughs> uh to anyone who's listening to this uh we're going to be pushing on uh, for one more session especially if you're part of the patreon um we're going to be pushing on and obviously we're going to be playing out for now with preferably men um we uh, as for sludge underground it's at sludge underground on instagram at sludge 031 on twitter at sludge underground on facebook and on spotify and everywhere else at sludge underground podcast um so we're going to jump back in just now if you're a patreon um if you are just uh listening through the normal channels it'll yeah that'll be bye for now so enjoy it's preferably men she came out to meet him.